Good afternoon and welcome to this week's McGill Alumni webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. For many of us, the retail industry is not even an industry that we think of in the traditional sense. And yet in 2019, retailers employed more than 2.2 million in this country, or one in six working Canadians, and the industry accounted for $615 billion in sales. One year later, it's a much different story here in Canada and indeed around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic forced 40% of the country's retailers to close their doors for at least five days. In some sectors, like clothing, that figure was over 90%. It's no stretch to say that few have been affected as much by this crisis as retailers. And hardly anybody who studies the sector is expecting the industry to bounce back exactly the way things once were. How are retailers adapting to the pandemic and new public health guidelines? Which retail sectors stand to gain the most? And which have the most to lose? And what technological innovations has the pandemic spawned? And what sorts of shopping experiences will greet us when we return to the stores and malls in large numbers? It's Tuesday, June 23rd. And in this week's McGill Alumni webcast, Talking Shop, How the COVID-19 Pandemic is Reshaping the Retail Industry, we'll hear from two professors from McGill's Bensadun School of Retail Management, who also happen to be two of the world's leading academic experts in the area of retail. Let me quickly introduce them. We have with us today Sable Ray, who's a James McGill Professor in Operations Management in the Des Hotel Faculty of Management and Academic Director of the Bensadun School of Retail Management. Welcome, Professor Ray. And Maxime Cohen, who is an Associate Professor of Retail Management and Operations Management, also at the Des Hotel School at McGill and Co-Director of the McGill Retail Innovation Lab. Welcome to both of you and thank you for taking time out of your schedules today to talk shop and shopping. And a reminder, if you do have a question for our panelists, you can send it in by email to aoc at mcgill.ca. That's aoc at mcgill.ca. So before we jump into specific questions about shopping in a pandemic, let's learn a little bit more about your work at McGill in this relatively new academic discipline that is retail. Uh, Professor Ray, I'll start with you. How long has McGill been involved in the teaching and research of retail management? And can you tell us a little bit about the vision behind the Benson School of Retail Management? Uh, thanks, Derek. Uh, thanks a lot for this op opportunity. Uh, we, really, we really appreciate it. Um, McGill has been working in uh, issues related to retail, whether it is uh, consumer behavior, supply chain, and so on, for, for a long time. So it, it's, in that way, it is not new. But the Bensadun School is a new one, which, uh, thanks to a very uh, significant philanthropic gift from Mr. Aldo Bensadun, we started in 2017 which started this Ben Sadun School. And our goal is to make this school the pre premier academic institution, uh, which is helping the retailers for the few, uh, to make them uh, be more successful in the future. And the whole idea is to bring in the whole capability of McGill, uh, the professors, students, our industrial partners, and uh, all, all, all types of partners to, um, to bring in, and our definition of retail is quite broad. So it's not like, physical, online, everything is anything B2C, business to consumer is to us retail. And to look at retail from different perspectives, whether it is marketing, supply chain, uh, uh, AI, uh, analytics, all these types of things, and also use retail, not only from the business perspective to improve the business, but also use retail for, to uh, address some of the grand challenges of society, whether it is sustainability, uh, issues of climate change, issues of equity, uh, privacy, and so on. So the whole idea is to make it the, the premier academic place in the whole world uh, for the future of retail. Great, well, thank you for that description for us. Uh, one more question for you, Professor Ray. I'm just curious, what kinds of students has the Ben Sedun School been able to attract so far? And why do you think there's been such an appetite among young people to study the retail industry like they would say law or medicine or engineering? Okay, so um, uh, two things. The first about why uh, why it is attractive. Uh, uh, one of the main reasons is that retail is one sector where you interact every day in your life. Uh, so it is not something uh, which is hidden behind. So in some way, everyone interacts with retail, whether it is buying something from Amazon or going to a corner store. Uh, you you interact with uh, retail all, every day uh, uh, in your life. So you see retail. And now you are seeing that uh, whether, and that is another advantage of retail is that you can come it from different perspective, whether it is from consumer behavior, 
a neuroscience perspective, analytics perspective, AI perspective, a society, uh, 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 public policy perspective. You can address retail from very different perspectives. So there is a room for everyone and there is a way to uh, where everyone can uh, play a part. And that is another very, very big goal for us to look at this multidisciplinarity and uh, Professor Cohen will talk about it a bit more, and so that that's that's that is why we I think that it is attractive to a lot of not only students but a lot of variety of students. So we attract very analytics oriented students who wants to AI analytics oriented, but also we are attracting very creative type of people who uh, who are uh, interested in retail from a design uh, from a society those types of perspectives. So. That is why I think that because of its broad scope and because of its everyday nature, that it has a play, uh, way to, uh, uh, is a very, very big part of the society. That's why it is attracting uh, these types of students. Great, well, thank you, thank you. Uh, Professor Cohen, so I introduced you as the co-director of the McGill Retail Innovation Lab. Uh, I'm guessing this is not a fancy new name for the McGill Bookstore. Um, can you tell us a bit more about this innovation lab? You know, when is it opening and how does this fit into the Ben Sedun School's framework of teaching, researching and developing best practices for the retail industry? Yes, definitely. So as uh, Professor Roy said, uh, thank you very much for having us today. So let me tell you a little bit more about the McGill Retail Innovation Lab, which I'm very happy to be one of the two co-directors. So the, 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 the store that we want to, to do it is like uh, to be cast as a store of the future. So in partnership with a large uh, Canadian retailer, we're gonna open a store. It's gonna be a live retail store open to anyone 24 seven. And a particularity of this uh, store of the future is gonna have a frictionless store. So I'm sure many of the people that are watching us heard about Amazon Go, which is a store open in Seattle. And since then, Amazon had opened a few others around the world where customers can go into the store, pick up a few items and just go out without any checkout, without waiting in line, without any human interaction. Everything is done with technology, with using some cameras. And uh, we are very excited to say that uh, our lab is gonna be the first frictionless store open in Canada. We are planning to open sometime in September. And uh, uh, another thing, going back to your question, so in terms of research, our goal is to conduct state-of-the-art research in retail management as well as in artificial intelligence. The focus is gonna be multidisciplinary. We're gonna have a lot of professors from various departments, management, engineering, sciences, you name it. And another big focus is on social good. We want this lab to help society. We're gonna study some privacy concerns, sustainability issues, anything that can make society at large a better place. And a part of the research, we also gonna use this lab as experiential learning from the classrooms. We really hope that some of the teachers in our school as well as in other schools will be using to use parts of the lab for teaching purposes. And the last thing I would like to make a very important point for the lab is gonna be definitely focused on students. The, the goal is to hire a lot of students at all levels undergraduate, master level, PhD, postdoctoral, we really want to have a lot of students involved in the McGill Retail Innovation Lab. Great, well, sounds very exciting. Um, so before we get into some of the longer term implications of the pandemic on the retail industry, I'm wondering if we could talk first about what the retail landscape has gone through during the first three months of the lockdown, uh, where we've seen some bricks and mortar shops have stayed open to deliver essential services, while so much retail activity has shifted online. Uh, Professor Ray, maybe I can start with you. Can you tell us what this, this dr very dramatic and sudden shift has meant for retailers who've had to make so many adjustments to the ways in which they welcome their customers into their establishments? Um, so uh, th the first thing is that, as you said, it was a very sudden, sudden shift, uh, especially for the retailers who were not ready for it. Obviously, there are some multinational retailers who had seen their experiences in Asia. So they were perhaps a bit more ready about what was happening, but for many other retailers, it really happened. And uh, uh, to some extent they were not ready because it, it, it looked like it was a thing that was happening in Asia. And suddenly in one week and like us in university, the way we changed our teaching, it was a sudden teaching change. The same way the retailers had to change uh, some of them had to change uh, that they are essential, they have to remain open, and some of them have to totally close. And when they want to close, they went from an offline, uh, uh, offline mode 
who are fully online mode. Many of them were omnichannel in the sense they were doing offline and online, but now they had to go fully online mode. So there were two, two problems. One side, the problems who had to keep it open, for them, they had to do a huge amount of change in the sense the consumers were, uh, the, the way they were shopping, uh, perhaps the biggest uh, example is grocery, which remained open. Um, they were, the consumers are coming less often to the store, but they were buying in much bigger uh, sizes. Like people were, uh, the government was telling them not to go out much. So they, rather than coming every two days, they were coming once a week, but that buying for the whole week. So the basket sizes were becoming much larger. The frequency of shopping was becoming much uh, 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 less. A and this means also they are, the way they were keeping the inventory. And so at, at the same time, they were having two other problems. Their cost of operations went up because they had to take a lot of um, safety precautions in terms of uh, distancing, in terms of cleaning hand, mask, whatever it is as well as the supply chains were also being affected throughout the world. So getting product into the store became a problem at, at the same time when consumers were trying to in some way hold because they, they were not uh, sure how long. So all this created this huge problem in the physical retail. At the same time in the online, the people who had to close, they were many of them were not ready, even the best ones like the Amazons and the Walmart were not ready for the jump in the online uh, 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 online uh, traffic. It, it went right away in one week, two weeks, it went eight times, 10 times of the normal volume of online sales. And most of these companies were not ready, even the best ones. So forget about the ones which are below. They had to, they had to totally go to an online channel and everything, how to, in terms of the website, in terms of the supply chain, in terms of the people who are working from home, everything needed to change. And so it was a, triple whammy in terms of the consumer side, in terms of the technology side, in terms of the supply chain side at the same time. So indeed, uh, and this is what, even when we are coming back, this is one of the things uh, which will uh, remain. So the main thing what, what was happening due to this uh, issue was uh, people, uh, the, the ones which were physical were having problems in terms of the way the consumer shop and the supply chain and the ones which uh, were closed their biggest problem was that mm -hmm. how to scale up the online side of the store. Right, right. So sticking to that online point, because obviously so much more shopping moved online and we see lots of consumers who probably never thought of actually making purchases online, dipping their toes in and trying it out, probably out of you know essential need, they had no other option. So do you think that once this pandemic sort of eases up and we're seeing even now sort of a reopening in many of our societies, that these traditional stores that maybe have not been very strong in the online uh, environment, will they be able to reclaim their share of the market as uh, as people go out and, and shop again? Or are what we witnessing now really the beginning of a, a much more permanent shift to more of an online shopping experience? I, I, I think this will be the whatever million dollar, trillion dollar question going forward, <laughs> at least for the Short, uh, short term and lots of academic research and all types of research will happen on this particular topic. That how much of the things that we are seeing is a short term uh, government imposed, uh, uh, a public health imposed uh, change in behavior and how much is a, a long term real change in customer behavior. Now, mm -hmm. most of the research until now sh uh, shows that some of them, maybe the amount which has moved from uh, uh, offline to online, which has been extremely, extremely high in some of the sectors, it has become 70, 80%. Perhaps it will not remain at that level. But the problem for many of these retailers is that, as you know, many of, retail in general is a very small margin business. Already, uh, 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 there were lots of stores, uh, uh, especially in North America, there were too many malls, too many stores. And now, even if even if 15 to 20% of the offline becomes permanently online, many of the retailers will be in trouble. And so the, the thing is that, yes, we are not expecting that 70, 80% uh, uh, which has shifted from offline to online will remain like that. Mm -hmm. But there is, everyone thinks that at least 15 to 20% of the shift is permanent, at least permanent in the sense uh, significantly uh, going uh, online. Obviously, it will depend on the um, consumer profile you are talking about in terms of 
whether the age profile you're talking about, but there will be a, uh, there will be 15 to 20% which will move from uh, on uh, offline to online permanently. Mm -hmm. And this means that many of these companies which were trying to go what we call omnichannel on offline to online now have to really step up their game to become really, really much more online, much more uh, uh, e-commerce savvy and all these types of things. And they need to do it because we expect and every retailers themselves expect that some of these changes, maybe not at the extent that we are seeing now, will be permanent. But mm -hmm. how much? That is still a question that we will see in the next five, six months. And maybe once the vaccine comes, maybe it will be even le a bit less, but at least we'll see in the next uh, six months to one year, uh, how much will it be uh, permanent? Mm -hmm. So thank you for, for that. It's a great perspective on, on the more traditional retailers needing to move to a more online environment. Professor Cohen, I'm curious to get your take on those retailers that have been quite savvy and have actually been, been using the internet to sell goods in some cases for over two decades now. And of course, some of the larger retailers that we're familiar with, like Amazon and Alibaba in China, have built their entire business models on online shopping. So I'm wondering from your perspective, how has the pandemic rewarded those retailers and what has it meant for sort of the, the online giants as we move forward into this new retail landscape? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I, we, I really want to highlight the fact that there are two sides of the coin here. On the one hand, as Professor Ray mentioned, online transactions definitely increased by a significant amount, both attracting new customers that never purchased online before, as well as increasing the volume of the current online customers. Now, on the other hand, the other side of the coin, many products were actually stocked out for those platforms like Amazon, like think about masks or think about hand sanitizers. For weeks, it was very hard to find those products available on those resilient online platforms. Now, if you also picture the fact that many people experienced a panic buying behavior and felt an urgency to buy some necessary goods right now, in that case, the best answer will be to go to a physical store. You need a product now, even if you go to Amazon, the best case scenario, you get delivered in 24 hours, but you cannot wait, you need a product right now. And therefore the, the only option could be to go to like a physical store. Now it's also important to mention in this context, the fact that many physical stores in Canada and uh, all over the world started offering or at least advertising some hybrid options. Think about a buy online pickup in store. And those type of options play a big role in the question you just asked. Mm -hmm. So in fact, um, we actually just got a question uh, that came in from one of our, one of our viewers uh, specifically about this hybrid option. So maybe I'll get to it now if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, this, the question came in from Lori Helens. So she's saying that while grocery delivery has improved dramatically, she's found that this curbside or contactless pickup has remained quite hit and miss. Some retailers, and she mentions Canadian Tire, have been pretty good at this, uh, while others have, ex have been dismally poor. Long wait times, poor fulfillment. Um, her question is, she's wondering if this particular service is something that retailers don't like doing, and do you see it disappearing as soon as stores are able to open up for in-store shopping? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Lori. Uh, I, I really think that uh, retailers potentially are not a big fan of it, but they have no choice. If they don't offer this type of option, they may lose a lot of customers to their competitors. So I do see like uh, the burden and the hassle that it can give to retailers, especially like, you know, you have to hire packers. Uh, packers is not like the best job mm -hmm. in the world. They have to interfere with current customers inside the store. They have to pack. They have to do everything. A lot of time they need to do decisions on the fly. There was an item that is on the list that is not available in the aisle. Do you substitute? If yes, which is the substitute items and so on and so forth. But at the same time, I would say now it became very common practice is buy online pickup in store. There are two versions of it. The first one is, as it was said in the question with the, your car, you can go with your vehicle, open your trunk. There is full contactless type of option. And the second one, you can just go and shop in the store and pick it up yourself without a car. And I fully agree that some retailers uh, did it and figured it out very nicely and others are, are still uh, discovering and improving. But in my opinion, there, there is a necessity of doing it properly if they don't want to lose some market share. Mm -hmm. Professor Ray, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, so I just wanted to add one thing to what uh, uh, Maxim is talking about. Um, uh, uh, the thing is that uh, 
in some way, it is also the best, if it can be done properly, it is the best of both worlds. Because as Maxim said, the biggest disadvantage of, of uh, online shopping is this time that you do not get it. But it, with buy uh, uh, online and pick up in store, you can actually go and pick, but you don't spend so much time to going inside the store. So in that way, you get this immediacy of uh, satisfaction. Uh, maybe not to go to a corner store, you have to go a bit longer and drive, but at least you get. And for the companies also, it is actually a best option because for the companies, the biggest disadvantage of online is this last mile delivery where they are delivering to your home, which is a very, very costly proposition for any company, even a company like Amazon or Walmart who are very efficient, it is even for them, but that they can reduce that cost if it is buy online and pick up in store. So if it can be, and I understand it is still not uh, 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 perhaps, and especially during this time, the volume was so high that it was not working properly, but it can be done. It is actually in some way the best of both worlds, both from a consumer perspective, as well as the retailer uh, retailer's perspective. Right, and putting even the healthcare issues aside, it seems like a very convenient option for consumers Absolutely. to put the order in, show up, like a drive-through essentially. Yes, exactly, drive-through, yeah. yeah, exactly. Great. Well, thank you so much, Laurie, for that, that great question. If anyone else does have any questions, please, you can send them to aoc at mcgill.ca, and we'll try to take as many as we can. Uh, Professor Cohen, I want to just turn uh, back to you for a minute. Um, we talked, obviously, about Amazon and some of the big retailers, but this, this shift and this sort of need to, to be more savvy and more ready to do business in an online environment, um, what does this mean for some of the smaller independent stores, you know, the so-called mom and pop shops that might not have the vision or the means to be a force in an online environment? Um, do you think this pandemic represents the final nail in the coffin for many of these smaller retailers? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. In, in my opinion, they should move fast. And I wouldn't see it as like a last coffin. I would see it more as an acceleration or as a kind of a wake up call for small retailers to move to the digital world and to start like really think about having an online presence. And it's not a matter of like making more business, it's a matter of survival. Now, something that is worth noting here is that small stores don't have to do them themselves. They can definitely rely on third party providers to increase or even to start their online presence. And the best example I always like to talk about is Shopify. Shopify recently has launched a service called Shopify Plus and has been very active by offering retailers to launch their online stores. What is very impressive in the last few weeks is the service that Shopify Plus is offering is allowing retailers to launch their online stores in a matter of weeks or sometimes even days. There was a very famous example from a couple of weeks ago from Lint. Lint launched a Canadian online store in five days from beginning to the end. So definitely like those type of services or providers can help address and bridge this gap of small retailers moving to the digital world. Hmm. Interesting. So there is some hope for, for some of these smaller shops for sure. Um, Professor Ray, uh, I, I'm curious, uh, sort of another ray of hope we've seen uh, during this pandemic are these campaigns that are popping up that are urging consumers to, to buy local and to support community-based retailers during these tough times. And we're thinking of things like the Panier Bleu campaign here in Quebec and support local initiatives in the United States. In your opinion, are these making a difference and will they have a list lasting impact? Or at the end of the day, are consumers ultimately going to be swayed by price and convenience? And, you know, if I can get my avocados cheaper at Costco and my T-shirts delivered to my front door by Amazon, is it just a matter of time before we're all shopping at these big multinationals? Uh, thanks, uh, Derek. Again, uh, 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 great question. Uh, and we are seeing these types of, uh, not only in Quebec, uh, Quebec, obviously, the Panier Blue is there, but uh, everywhere in the world, there is a, uh, move towards a more what you would call local supply chains and local retailers. Uh, and as, as the cases have been made, this is actually great in a multiple uh, from multiple perspectives. It is great from an economic perspective, uh, from a local economy perspective. It is great from a sub, uh, sustainability perspective because you uh, perhaps reduce the greenhouse gas emission uh, significantly uh, by taking out the transportation from the supply chain. It is uh, uh, great from a risk management perspective because uh, uh, many of these long supply chains that we have uh, started to uh, depend on are very risky. Uh, uh, 
So uh, as we saw with the uh, things about uh, the grocery during the beginning of the pandemic, or from all this perspective, the local uh, the local initiatives um, are great. But uh, there are two caveats to this uh, issue. One is um, uh, in a country like Canada, with it, with our type of climate, uh, uh, getting that all types of products, uh, especially I'm talking mostly about grocery where there is a particular push towards uh, 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 local because there are certain complex complex machinery that bringing, making them local, it, it is very difficult. Um, uh, it, it will not happen in the short term. The one where the focus has been, and even for Penny and Blue, is more on the food industry, the local food. And, and that is perhaps the one which can happen the fastest and uh, as the most impact. But even then, given our uh, climate situation, we have to be very careful what we can do, what we cannot do. And so we might have to have local, but perhaps go up beyond local that, let's say Quebec, uh, Eastern, uh, uh, East Canada and Ontario together, rather than just focus on Quebec. Uh, uh, because, uh, because of the constraints that we have, in terms of the weather, in terms of what we can do and what we cannot do in terms of the production. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that variety might get affected if we are very focused very much on local. And that I'm not telling it's a bad thing, but people have to keep that in mind that the, the normal variety that you are getting, you might not be able to get that if you become very local. And the second thing mm -hmm. is, uh, which is the point that you made, we, we have heard this story before also. Whenever there is a big uh, thing happen, we always talk about, can we make the supply chains local? And I am very interested to see after two years, are we willing to, suppose the pandemic goes, suppose there is a vaccine, suppose things go back to whatever the new normal is, relatively normal. Are we willing to uh, pay more for a local product or not? And that's the question. And what is that percentage? Again, from a retail, there is always a 10% of the population who can afford to pay the premium for a local product, for, for all this product. But that cannot be, that will not change the whole uh, industry. Can this 10% to become 40 to 50% who are willing to pay the premium for buying local? And that's what I am trying to, yes, in the short term, I totally agree they will buy. But what about in the long term, when things go back to the normal? And this is the same issue which we are talking about in terms of, we are talking here about food, but even for the PPE, this, this uh, the uh, personal protective equipment, this is the same thing. We are talking about, we should have big local supply chains making PPEs. We should have stock a lot of things for PPEs. But again, the same question comes. In two years down the road, will we, the same people, we will ask questions to the government why you are stocking so much of PPE? Why you are using public money to stock so much of PPE when it is not required? And that's my question that it, this is not the, I have been working in supply chain for the last 20, 25 years. And every five years, there is something when, whether it is a financial crash, whether it is the tsunami crash, whether it is something else, every five years, there is a push towards this local supply chains. And that's great. But the question for me is, sustainability of this interest sustainability not in terms of the environmental sustainability but the sustainability of this interest are we willing to pay the premium when things go back to normal mm -hmm. we might have to pay a premium again i am not telling necessarily but in some of the things we might have to pay a premium and if people are willing and if there is a significant amount of people it's not only 10 percent if there is a significant amount of people who are willing this will be a very very great improvement it, 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 theoretically, it is the best in terms of risk, in terms of sustainability, in terms of economy, in terms of uh, society, it is the best. The question is that are the consumers willing to support this initiative long term? Mm -hmm. So another follow-up question for you, Professor Ray, is small, are smaller retailers faring better in other parts of the world? And are there lessons uh, to be learned by North American retailers from some of these experiences in other countries? Yeah, so the th it, it is uh, what uh, what was uh, mentioned by Maxim actually in some way that what we have seen and um, the bigger getting bigger is a is a story in the retail industry throughout the world. I Means like uh, here we are talking about Amazon and Walmart. 
you go to china you are talking about alibaba and jedi you talk go to india you are talking about uh, flipkart so these types of bigger retailers becoming bigger is a story unfortunately almost in every part of the world but as uh, maxim mentioned there are new ideas coming up of some of the smaller retailers taking advantage of services like shopify to improve what they can deliver because again as a customer i would very much like to uh, uh, support my local retailer if i can also get the convenience that i get from a, a bigger one it will be the best of both worlds there is no way i will go to a um, i would like to go to a local retailer the question is that can these small retailers take advantage and wake up to this and take advantage of the services which are uh, available to, uh, today and uh, given shopify is a canadian company it's a great one uh, to uh, to try to uh, uh, get advantage of providing this convenience to the customers another mm -hmm. i want to uh, 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 um, suggest is some of these local pop, mom and pop convenience stores which we call here the penners the depenners can be actually used with the big companies as the because their biggest advantage is again this issue of location they are located at the street corner near to the places where the customers are and this again going back to what we are telling biggest problem with online the two biggest problem from a consumer side the biggest problem of online is the waiting that you do not get quickly the material that you order and second thing from the retailer's perspective the biggest problem is this last mile delivery the cost of delivering the product to if some way these small retailers can connect to the big retailers as working towards they get the order from the big retailers but they are making money by making the deliveries to the uh, 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 to the uh, customers then customers can get it very quickly because the most of the small retailers are located in the locality so they can get very quickly mm -hmm. so the time we should as well as from the big retailers perspective there is uh, 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 the cost savings by uh, uh, through from the logistics perspective but again mm -hmm. we have to these things have been tried in other parts of the world uh, in, both in europe and asia obviously the the issue here is again whether some of this revenue will be taken up by these big guys too much so there is a risk i am not telling that the risk is not there but there are ways shopify or using the small retailers uh to make this local deliveries there is a way that the local deliveries the local retailers can still be uh, survived and thrive great thank you thank you for for that response so let's talk for a moment a bit about what the shopping experience will be like in stores and shopping malls now that we're seeing you know people you know public health guidelines easing a little bit and people are are being allowed to go out more in in many of the jurisdictions uh that we are observing um so I imagine that there obviously must be some pent up demand from people who are tired of being homebound. Uh, but shopping is also supposed to be a fun and, and social experience. So I'm wondering, Professor Ray, um, in your opinion, will people still be enthusiastic about going out to the malls if they need to line up to enter stores and submit to temperature checks and wear face masks and perhaps not be allowed to try clothes on in, in a fitting room? It seems like we're taking all the fun out of the shopping. Yeah. So uh, again, this is a uh, this is a great question, and obviously, this is a question that the uh, retailers are uh, thinking about uh, all the time. That what will happen with the new normal? Will the customers come back? Uh, because as we said, that initially in the uh, uh, in the pandemic, there was issues from supply chain side as well as the consumer demand side from a public health perspective. Now the supply chain sides, the delivery supply side seems to be okay. the things are improving so there is no problem from that much problem on the supply side now the biggest question is that now that the, as the public health regulations throughout at least in many parts of the world are slowly reducing will the customers come back when they are allowed to come back will the customers come back because uh, there is a issue of the retailers are still have to bear some extra cost today for the public health perspective in terms of Uh, restrictions uh, 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 how many shoppers can be there in terms of hand sanitizers in terms of plexiglass all these things there are extra cost now at the same time if there is a demand shock that the customers don't come back that will be a big problem now the question of that there are this issue of experience and so this is the issue there are certain parts of retailers where it is more convenient uh, it's more efficiency or convenience that one i think will not be affected the question is that the industries 
which are what we call experience industry, where the, perhaps apparel, where people want to experience, want to uh, uh, choose and select and so on, whether that thing will be there. I have a feeling that getting back to that level, uh, that part of the story, the experience retail part of the story will take quite a bit of time to come back to normal. Uh, the, co the, the customers will uh, will be hesitant, at least that's my feeling. I will be uh, very, I will be happy to uh, prove mm -hmm. wrong in this case that mm -hmm. if they come back in droves, uh, it would be great. But my feeling is that that part of the uh, retail uh, uh, will take a bit of time to come back. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not fun standing in the sun uh, in a line and then come back, your temperature check, and then you are told that, oh, don't take up this one. You cannot see this one. Um, you have to do a lot of, uh, and you come and just pick up. If it is just picking up from the store, you can as well order from online. What's the point of coming to the store just to pick up? Mm -hmm. The question right. is that the only reason for going to the store is this experience. And if the experience is cut, I have my concerns about this experiential retail part of the store. Right. So, uh, Professor Cohen, um, maybe we'll just stay on the same that same sort of topic for a minute, and maybe in terms of a broader perspective on sort of the future of consumerism. So, assuming we're not hit by a second wave uh, of the pandemic, and that the economy does in fact bounce back quite well, do you think people are likely to return to their former shopping and spending ways, or would people likely to spend less in general so they can save more of their disposable income for the next rainy day? So yeah, this one is a little bit hard to know and only future will really tell us what will happen. Now, in my personal opinion, like people will still be affected for some time and they will definitely limit their trips to retail stores. Again, it may be have a small nuance between like different types of retail sectors, but overall the consensus will be to limit the, the, the trips to stores. Now, as it was said at the beginning, like they will shop less often, but maybe they will buy larger quantities, especially like think about groceries. Also, what is uh, interesting to note here is like if many people continue working from home and many of the tech firms already make announcement that a uh, big chunk of the workforce will continue to work from home at least until the end of the year. I mean, there is a clear need that is removing of buying new clothing, right? If you work from home, you care a little bit less about your physical appearance. So there is less people to be inclined to buy clothing at least. <laughs> now, at the end of the day, I, I, I want to keep like being optimistic and hopefully like a vaccine will be found soon and everything will be maybe not back to normal, but at least closer to the normal we all knew from the pre-pandemic landscape. Actually, if I remember correct, uh, Derek, this was a topic of the webinar two weeks ago, right? Um, yes, and I'm glad you were watching that one. <laughs> so, fingers crossed, yeah. hopefully we have a vaccine soon. And uh... Yes, 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 yes. Um, great. So, um, let me just stick with you for, for a minute, Professor Cohen. Um, in terms of new technologies that we might see uh, emerge in, in the uh, shopping experience, obviously retailers now need to move to you know, practicing physical distancing and, and of course keeping their employees safe from shoppers who may be infected with the, with the virus. Um, so are we about to embark on this sort of new wave of technology in terms of more self-checkout counters, contactless payment methods? Is, is just the role of technology gonna play a bigger role in the shopping experience for most people? Yes, so technology will definitely play a very important role here. Now, I'm very glad that you brought up the, the topic of contactless. Uh, I couldn't agree more that the shopping experience will move more and more towards contactless. So we can see it in different stages. The first stage that we already see in several stores is contactless payments. So now it's very common in many different retail sectors to have an option to pay without having any contact. For example, you can pay with your smartphone in many stores. Now, beyond that, there is also uh, some tests using facial recognition for payment, especially in China. So you can just go there, show up, there'll be like a scanning device uh, that scans your, your face and you can pay using facial recognition. So payment contactless is already there. Now, another one that started popping up uh, uh, recently is that retailers started also using contactless returns. There was a huge issue in retail management on how to handle uh, customer returns. 
and many uh, retailers around the world are start uh, testing some type of returns that can be done contactless. You can go there, there will be some type of bins that you can scan a barcode on your product, it put it, it sends you an email confirmation, there is no contact with anything or anyone. Now, the third uh, component is about checkout or waiting line. As we already mentioned at the beginning of this webcast, our lab, the McGill Retail Innovation Lab, will test a frictionless technology that already exists, like uh, Amazon and Alibaba have been ex experiencing this type of technology for a long time. And the goal is to, with the help of technology and cameras and the AI, to totally eliminate the checkout process altogether. There is no need of checking out. Now, moving forward, we are not there yet, but potentially there'll be one day where we can have a full contactless type of ex shopping experience with the help of technology as well. So we're not there yet. For the payment, we already did it. For the returns, it's done as we speak. For the, for the waiting line, it's also done as we speak, but it's still, there is still some amount of contact that remains to be, to be removed mm -hmm. from the experience. Mm -hmm. Do you expect that customers will sort of accept and embrace all of these new innovations? Or is that going to really be more of a demographic thing where younger customers will, will appreciate all of this and perhaps older customers will still like to stand in line and go through a checkout line with a, with a customer service representative? So it really depends. If there are clear benefits and very little harm, I think that most customers will embrace those type of technologies. Now, the key here is for retailers to communicate clearly with their customers. They should really invest a lot of time communicating the right message. Now, another aspect probably like you are alluding to is the context of privacy. There is definitely a trade-off here between collecting data about customers. So if everything is done electronically, it gives a very nice opportunity for retailers to collect large and granular amounts of customer data. Now, on the other side of the coin, there is a preserving the customer privacy. So there is a lot of research that needs to be done. And this is one of the topics we also want to study and uh, research in our own lab about the trade-off between collecting large amounts of data, but at the same time, preserving customer privacy, which is compliant with most of the restrictions that are in most uh, countries, and also to communicate clearly to the customers that we are collecting data only to benefit them, to offer better customer service, a better personalization of the services. But at the same time, we preserve privacy and we don't use this type of data to harm customers. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, jump to some of the alumni questions because we are getting quite a few that are coming in. I'll, I'll remind everyone of the email address again. You can send in your questions to aoc at mcgill.ca. Uh, so let me just turn my attention here to this. Um, here's one that's come in from Jonathan Gurvey. Uh, so he's asking, if we are to see a significant permanent shift from firms and companies moving from bricks and mortar to online retail spaces, how will this affect the customer service relationships and resulting strategy that businesses might use to create or enhance their competitive advantage? So I guess the question is really around how does customer service uh, sort of impacted by all this uh, if people are moving to contactless and more of an online experience? I, I can try to take a shot. I mean, is it, mm -hmm. definitely the customer service is going to be at the core of the competitive advantage of retailers. No matter if you move to online or stay in offline, definitely improving and enhancing customer service is going to be important. Now, I can see at least one advantage. If you move more to the online world, you have more information about customers. So this extra information that you have can help you tailor and personalize a customer service to each individual. And here we can use some research about machine learning and artificial intelligence to design a customer service that is using a lot of data about customers' attributes and personalize a service to each and every customer. So that at least that can be one of the advantage. Another thing to mention here is again this concept of returns. When people go to the store, it's easier to test the products, to scan it, to check it, and you are more confident about your purchase. When you are in an online environment, and many retailers now offer free returns, there is a huge incentive for you to, you know, I don't know the size of my shoe, let me buy two or three sizes, I'll try them on, or two different colors, and then I will return the one I don't like, or that mm -hmm. don't fit me well. Now there is a huge issue of handling those returns properly. And I know that a lot of uh, companies are really paying a lot of attention on how to handle returns, in particular customer service related to returns, 
in a swift and smooth fashion. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that. So here's a question from uh, Solange. I guess it's a similar, similar theme. Uh, she's obviously referring to the disadvantage of online retail in that there's no service and you have to wait for your product. Um, she's asking, how do you see specialty retailers evolving? Um, so not in the, so much the mass retailers, but those who are dealing with specialty products uh, where you need to see what you're buying, uh, how it feels, how it fits and how it looks. Professor Ray, do you want to jump in on that yeah. one? Uh, thank you, Mr. Storm. I, I think if it's Solange, I, I'm guessing it's Solange Storm, uh, uh, maybe. Uh, um, so uh, I, I wanted, uh, so this is again an issue which we discussed before. Um, one of the like high fashion retailers, um, they, they, they are, at least in the short term, they will be on the specialty retailers, they will be at a disadvantage uh, in the short term because of this lack of, if people are not going to the store, if people are not uh, uh, afraid of checking out things, uh, uh, this will be at a disadvantage. So the specialty retailers, the one advantage of specialty retailers, obviously in terms of the social distancing and all, because they are compared to the uh, general retailers, their demand, the traffic is much less. So actually they can design their store so that these things, these checkings and things can be done in still in a relatively safe fashion compared to a grocery store. So the advantage for them is that low traffic can actually help them in terms of maintaining social distancing. The disadvantage for them is that the issue of checking things, people might be very hesitant to do these things. And so they have to think about new ways of even is it possible to do some of these things which are done by uh, uh, some of these um, online fashion retailers uh, uh, as Maxim uh, mentioned about uh, they can uh, send things uh, uh, and then the the customers can check at home if they like they keep it if they don't like they uh, send it back uh, which al already are done by a number of uh, online fashion retailers so they they have to try those types of things much more aggressively than they were before. But in the short term, that is one sector which will be affected. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Prep, and thank you, Solange, for, the, for the sending in that question. Uh, here's one for you, Professor Cohen. This one came in from Vivian. She's asking if you can explain a bit further the concept of frictionless stores of the future and how these may work to improve the shopping experience during a pandemic such as this one. Definitely happy to elaborate on this one. This is a topic very close to my heart. So think about, you have a little store, let's call it a box, you know, with about three, 400 items in it. And the store is closed. And to open it, you have to use a smartphone. So you have a QR code on your smartphone. You're gonna scan a QR code ban at the entrance of the store. You're gonna get in the store. Then you can go and pick up whatever you want. Let's say you pick up a sandwich, you pick up a bag of chips, you pick up like a drink. And then you're gonna go out of the store, no human interaction, no friction, no waiting line, no payment. Everything is done through the app. Now, how is it possible with the use of technology? Especially uh, cameras that are on the setting, like a dozen of cameras can track the movements of, of customers inside the store, as well as shelf sensors. Because there is a big question here, if you pick up an item and put it back, you want the, technology to be able to detect that and not charge you for the item you didn't take. And now technology today is here. If you go to Seattle, I strongly invite you to go to the store of Amazon. And again, there's many other cities, especially there was one in New York. There was a few others in, in North America. And we're going to open at McGill. If you live in Montreal, you can welcome to visit our, our store uh, after September. We're going to have the first one, the frictionless store. And again, the, the good thing about it, you go in, you go out, you pick up whatever you want. There is no friction, no checkout line, no human interaction. Everything is done automatically with the help of technology. Wow. So it almost feels like walking into a giant vending machine. <laughs> you just better pick what you want. And yeah, that's some a very good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So I was going to ask at some point about some crazy technologies that we might be seeing, but this one's sort of blown my mind. So um, are there any other really crazy technologies out there that maybe people like myself haven't even thought of or heard of that, that might be coming to a, a store near, near us? So yeah, I really like this uh, question. So I, I don't know if you remember, but Amazon had like a, a huge uh, publicity around like having a drone deliveries. So we still hope mm -hmm. that one day those drone deliveries will come to our door. I mean, it's still not the case, but I'm still optimistic it will arrive mm -hmm. at one point. Now, uh, I, another direction that I'm very keen about is the use of augmented reality 
and virtual reality to enhance the shopping experience. Now think about wearing goggles, you can wear some goggles and being totally immersed in the store on a real-time basis. But all of this is happening from your backyard or even from your basement. You're gonna wear the goggles, you're gonna be immersed inside the store, you're gonna walk on it, you can browse it, you can look at it with the help of your phone, you can look at some information about some items, you can, send, you can get personalized discount or personalized promotion when you are immersed in the store with the help of augmented reality and virtual reality. In fact, let me do a little bit of, uh, of a shameless plug here. This is going to be one of our key projects that we want to pursue in the McGill Retail Innovation Lab. Wow. And what I like about this project is this interdisciplinarity type of, uh, of uh, collaboration that will involve engineering people, vision people. There is also a lot of design artists to design the store layout to be seen in the goggles, as well as some management practices. Great. And Professor Ray, I see you eagerly want to jump in on this one as well. Uh, yeah, so I just want, uh, perhaps this technology is a bit down the road uh, compared to some of the things that uh, uh, Professor Quen said. Uh, maybe 3D printing that you do not have to go to a store. You can, uh, you can do the product in your home. You get the design of the product on computer and you have a 3D printer at your home. 3D printers still are relatively expensive, but once I'm telling Maybe down ten years down the road, if the uh, uh, if the three D printers become very cheap, perhaps you do not need to go to the store a shoe or a shirt. You can make with the design which is downloaded. You give it, and it uh, the three D printer does it at home. So which will be perfect. You do not even have to uh, remove. You have to buy, <laughs> still buy the uh, raw material, but uh, 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 but three D printers can uh, do that. Uh, and I, that will take a bit lo longer time than what are the other things that were taught, perhaps a bit more uh, science uh, uh, fiction, but uh, but it, it is there already for certain products, mm -hmm. but perhaps it, it is still not mass. Uh, so mm -hmm. that will take a bit more. Time. Right. Well, I'm excited. When I was a kid, they promised us flying cars and we're still waiting. I guess I watched the, too much of the Jetsons, but uh, the 3D printing sounds interesting. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, let me turn to this one from Pierre-André. Um, so he's asking about the recent announcement of Shopify becoming the first e-commerce platform to integrate with Walmart.com. And how is this going to change the game for retail? I, uh, Maxim, is it okay if I... Uh, okay. Um, so I think this is more of a, to tell you the truth, uh, this particular one, I, I am much more excited about what uh, Shopify did, what Maxim mentioned about from the small retailer side. This is more of a uh, competition to uh, Amazon rather than, it's a more of a- about the recent announcement. Of <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, but, this is more of a business uh, deal rather than, it, it, it is, Shopify plus Amazon, uh, Shopify plus Walmart will be a really, really big competitor to Amazon. So I would, I would put this one as a more of a business, uh, a, a Game of Thrones, uh, people, uh, the, <laughs> the big players fighting out each other rather than, rather than really changing. It, it will have big implications of how they compete with Amazon, but perhaps not in other sense. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I am much more excited about what Shopify does with the small players rather than that they are, they, from a business perspective, from a share price perspective, perhaps that's a mm -hmm. very, very big deal and how they compete with Amazon. But I'm less excited about that uh, particular deal. Yeah. Okay, great. So we have time for one more question. Uh, this one came in from Tony Rupchinski. I'll, I'll put it out there and you'll let me know if you, if you want to answer it. Um, he's asking specifically about Amazon. Uh, he refers to it as an octopus with many investments, as well as many questionable practices in employee and seller relations. His question, is Amazon good for the retail industry or do they need to be reined in? Or is that too political for someone in the uh, <laughs> I, I, in your business? To, Go to ahead, Professor short, Cohen. <laughs> I, I'm happy to take a short while staying uh, politically correct and not being biased <laughs> uh, anyway. One thing worth mentioning about Amazon, which uh, was a very underrated news a couple of weeks ago about being the first vaccinated supply chain. And I think that's a very good point for all of us, including like uh, society at large. Think about uh, Jeff Bezos investing millions, if not billions of dollars to vaccinate every single player along the supply chain. Now, what is interesting is it's one of the only companies in the world that has the ability to claim that the supply chain from A to Z, think about all the manufacturers, all the distributors, all the suppliers, 
the packers, the people, the last mile delivery. If you think about Walmart, they cannot do it. Why they cannot do it? Because they use UPS and FedEx and those companies to deliver. So they don't own the entire supply chain. Amazon, on the other one, is the only company that owns from the beginning to the end. So if we don't find a vaccine, and again, it's all going back to this vaccine uh, webcast that I encourage alumni to look at, mm -hmm. is maybe like a very good news for society that Amazon will be the only one that can give transparency proves that everything is vaccinated from A to Z, and therefore there is a lot of safety measures that are taken. Now, again, I, I prefer not to comment a little more on the other aspect. That would be like my, my, my take on this. Mm -hmm. okay. My feeling is that whatever we say, uh, given the situation in US, there will be some restrictions coming on Amazon at certain point. But the question is that, Will it come before November elections? Will it will it, uh, will it happen after a year? But there will be some restrictions coming anyway uh, at, at Amazon. Yeah, so. Great, great. Well, thank you, and, and thank you, Tony, for that for that question. And hopefully, one of these weeks, I'm, I'll pronounce your last name correctly. Maybe I did this week. So, um, so we have about two minutes left. So maybe I'll just throw one final question out to each of you. Maybe you can give me a sort of a quick one minute uh, response, each of you. But that's sort of if you look back now, sort of at the pandemic, and if you were sort of you know fast forward a few years ahead of time, and now you're you're a scholar looking back, writing the future of retail. What do you think sort of is the 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 single biggest uh, lesson that retailers are going to take away from this experience of the past few months. Professor Cohen, should I, if I'll start with you on that one? Sure, sure. So if I understood correctly, the question is like, what is a takeaway and what's the main lesson that retailers could learn from these uh, challenging yeah. times? So first of all is uh, this switch from small retailers to the digitization. Like, you know, like I'm in this world for many years now and you hear those retailers talking and talking about moving to the digital world. They just talk about it, but they never pull the trigger. Now they realize that they have no choice, you know, like they need to do it and therefore they did it. And it was much easier than they realized. So maybe mm -hmm. like they could realize that actually the online world is not so difficult, is not so scary. And they can learn that they can also compete with the big guys there in the online world by having a presence, by having an infrastructure that can help them also offer some type of online convenience. That'll be my uh, quick take mm -hmm. of reacting on the fly to your question. Okay, great. And Professor Ray? Uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Professor Quinn. The, the main thing is that it's not that we are seeing something very new. Perhaps there was a very much new for two months when the supply chains totally stopped because of the public health. But otherwise, from a consumer perspective, what was happening in the last five, six years, it really sped up the thing that moving from offline to online. So it, it was nothing, something new, but it really uh, accelerated the change. What would happen in the next five years? It happened in the two months, three months. And so that's the thing that now the retailers need to change that there will be some of this offline to online move will happen. They need to digitize, they need to move to omnichannel, they cannot anyway, and they need to think about their supply chains and how to, how to re reduce the risk in their supply chains much, much carefully. So one is the consumer side, as uh, Professor Quinn mentioned, and that is from the supply chain side, how to reduce the risk in their supply chain. So these are the two things that they need to, they need to remember it, not they, they need, after the six months, when it comes back to normal, they should not forget about it until the next, uh, uh, again, pandemic or next uh, crisis. Great, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And this has been such an, an incredibly fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. So thank you both for your, for your time. Uh, that does wrap up the time we do have today uh, for this webcast. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind uh, everyone that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who have not were not able to tune in live. And you could also go on the website and look at all the past webcasts that we've done, including the one that uh, Professor Cohen referred to a couple weeks ago on, on vaccine development. Uh, and please keep watching your email and social media feeds for more opportunities through this series and through other webinars offered by McGill's alumni relations team. To learn about how McGill is confronting the challenges of COVID-19 and keeping you informed with insight from our academic, medical, and business experts. And of course, a, a huge thank you to Professors Sable Ray and Maxime Cohen from McGill's Bensudu School of Retail Management for joining us today and for sharing such deep knowledge uh, and insight of the retail industry with us, as well as to our friends at the Des Hotel Faculty of Management and the Dell Thought Leadership Platform for helping us organize this panel, including Managing Editor Rosalie Nardelli. And finally, a big thank you to all of our McGill alumni and all other viewers for tuning into these webcasts week after week 
and for submitting great questions to our guests and sharing such thoughtful notes and constructive feedback with me and my colleagues. We've now put together 18 of these webcasts since the middle of March with a total viewership of nearly 140,000. So thank you for your continued interest in McGill's academic and research expertise and our response to the pandemic. The team behind these webcasts, myself included, will be taking some well-deserved time off, but we will be back at it later this summer. In fact, our next webcast will take place in two weeks on Thursday, July 9th, when we welcome back Dr. Tim Evans from McGill's School of Population and Global Health and other experts from the medical field for an update on the pandemic and what we need to do to avoid a second wave of outbreaks. Until then, please stay safe and be well and enjoy the warm weather wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you back here on July 9th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.